A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the fourth and the final technical session of basic and applied sciences track of 15th International Research Conference. It's with great honor I do introduce the chairperson for this session on the life sciences, Dr. Kirti Sri Jayasekara. Dr. Kirti Jayasekara completed his PhD in clinical chemistry at University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. He currently acts as a senior lecturer at Department of Medical Laboratory Science, Faculty of Allied, Science, Allied Health Sciences, General Sir John Kothalavari Defense University, Colombo. Having served as the head of the department for three consecutive years, he was also the conference chair of International Research Conference in the year of 2016. Dr. Jayasekar has been an eminent researcher with postdoctoral fellowship at School of Public Health, Pittsburgh University, USA. He has more than 30 of his papers published along with 100 and more research collaborations. Being the eminent researcher he is, he has won several presidential awards, outstanding research and publications. Also, he is an investigator of three research collaborations with Cardiff University, UK, Washington University, and Pittsburgh University, USA. Currently, Dr. Jayasekara is acting as the PI of two research grants while serving as an associate editor and reviewer in several local and international journals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome J.M.K.B. Jayasekara. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome to the fourth technical session of basic sciences uh, under the theme of life sciences. Uh, in this session, six presenters, they are going to present their research findings relevant to the various field of science as uh, food, new food supplements used in two medicinal plants, uh, Sri Lankan gulls flying over Himalayas, growth and yield of rice varieties under greenhouse conditions, and black oyster growing in Sri Lanka insecticide use uh, against mosquito control in uh, Colombo Municipal Council area. And finally, uh, the anxiety among cricket players in school level. Right, without taking much time, then let me introduce the guidelines for the presenters. I think the one present is online. Huh? Is she available? Okay. Totally, to, uh, you have 12 minutes for your presentation. Then after 10 minutes, tap the bell for one time. Then please remember you have uh, only two minutes remaining after the first tap. And after 12 minutes, tap the bell for twice. And then you should conclude your presentation as uh, soon as possible. Uh, after the presentation, you have three minutes uh, question and answer session. The audience and the panel of judges, you can ask questions from them. Shall we move into the first presentation? I'd like to invite the first presenter, I think she's online, uh, a mixture of two endemic plants as various form of food supplements with heightened biological activity uh, by A.I. Kurupu, P. Galhena, P. Paranagama and R. D. Silva uh, will be presented online by Anchala A.I. Kurupu. Can you hear us, Anchala? Yes, good afternoon. Let me share my uh, screen. Am I audible to you all? Am I audible? Okay, let me let me share my screen. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. 
So my topic today is a mixture of two endemic plants as various forms of food supplements with heightened biological activity. You can start, Angela. Can you hear me? We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear Wait, me Angela. now? Wait, we, we can't hear you. Is it much better now? Hello? Can you hear me now? Recording in progress. Can you all hear me now? Hello? Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me now? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. So my topic today is a mixture of two endemic plants as various forms of food supplements with heightened biological activity. As you know, Sri Lanka has a very rich biodiversity of plants with around 3,700 plant species. And interestingly, half of it is endemic to the country. And uh, we have a very rich uh, traditional medicine history as well, and this is mostly plant-based. And also plants and herbs are used for developing various food supplements. And uh, if you consider the global food supplement market and the personal care market, it has reached a value of about US dollars 30 billion, even during the pandemic, which was uh, in 2021. And it's projected to actually rise to about 50 billion US dollars in year 2027. Now, food supplements, for example, can be vitamins, uh, minerals, herbs, or any other substances which will actually provide any health benefit. And it can be in the form of uh, pills, capsules, powders, drinks, um, syrups, or even teas. Many people consider herbs and botanicals to be natural and therefore healthier and gentler than conventional Western medicine. Now, although the herbal food supplement and cosmetic industry has hugely increased globally, in Sri Lanka, this is quite low at the moment. And I think we can develop more uh, food supplements for the export market. What we did was we selected two endemic plants, as you can see on the screen, Ospechia octandra and Rhytia anti-dententerica. Ospechia octandra is named as Heenbovitia in the Sinhalese language, and it's used for various diseases like hemorrhoids, liver diseases, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia in the traditional medicine system in Sri Lanka. Rhytia is also known as Balidha in the Sinhalese language, and it's commonly uh, given for tonsillitis, snake bites, skin disorders in the traditional medicine system. If we move on to the methodology, so what we first initially did was, uh, we selected the leaves, the stem, the roots, the whole plant, and the flowers of each of these plants, and we prepared cool, crude extracts by organic solvent. And we did various bioassays, like, for example, antioxidant assays, anti-inflammatory assays, anti-cancer, anti-lipidemic, various assays like this. 
And uh, if I focus at the moment on um, the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory results, so with the methanol extract of barley, the stem, we actually found that this particular uh, extract had an ICA-50 value of 0.27 milligrams per ml, which was actually uh, quite good. And if you looked at the methanol extract of Heenbovity of the whole plant, this was highly actually significant, which had a very high antioxidant activity, which was IC50 0.01 milligram per ml. This was actually 10 times more potent than the positive control that we used, which was butylated hydroxytoline. We also looked at um, the methanol extract of valid the stem with anti-inflammatory um, activity. And we again found that uh, these two extracts, the, the stem extract of valid and the whole plant extract of in Govitia was quite good and it had anti-inflammatory activity compared to the positive, com positive uh, control. Next, what we did was since uh, these two extracts, like the, the stem of the valid and the whole plant of the Heenbovitia had very good activity, we thought we could actually develop a food supplement with this. So we selected the whole plant of Heenbovitia and the stem of valid and we went on developing a tea bag and a capsule with these two plants in combination. So we prepared a, a, a hot and a cold aqueous extract and then we used um, different ratios. As you can see in the table, we used uh, different ratios of the two plants. And we found that the one-to-one -one ratio, the combination of one-to-one -one ratio of the two plants were the best when we conducted various bioassays, especially the antioxidant assays. If I move on to uh, the one-to-one -one ratio um, samples, so you can see in the table, so we used a hot extract and also a cold extract, and we also compared this to the herbs alone. So we first did the total phenolic content. We used something called the fallen sear catch you um, experiment to do this. And then as you can see in the table, the one-to-one -one ratio of the hot extract gave us 87.20 milligrams per gallic acid equivalent grams for the hot extract, which was actually very high compared to the other um, samples. And even the cold extract gave us 68.63 milligrams per gallic acid equivalent, which is again higher than the single herbs alone, if you can see in the table. Now, for example, if you look at the Heenbovitia only hot extract, it only gave us 64.77 milligram, but the combination of two plants in a one-to-one -one ratio was quite better. If I move on to the total flavonoid content, we used an aluminum chloride assay here. And again, you can see that the combined um, food supplements were actually quite good. So if you look at the one-to-one -one ratio of the hot extract, um, we could see that we found a flavonoid content of 44.52 milligrams per quantity in equivalent grams. And the cold extract actually gave 34.09 milligrams quantity in equivalent grams, which was actually higher than the single herbs alone. If I move on to the antioxidant um, experiments here, um, so again, you can see we did a DPPH assay here, and you could see that the one-to-one -one ratio of the hot extract was extremely potent. The IC50 value was very low, 0 0.004 milligrams per ml. And if you compare this with the standard butylated hydroxytoluene, which was a positive control, this was actually around um, four times more potent. And also, if you look at the one-to-one -one ratio of the cold extract, it's actually the same as the positive control. So you can see how uh, potent or you know, the activity of the one-to-one -one when you combine the plants than looking at the single plants alone. If you, for example, if I look at a single plant, you can see the barley, the only hot extract, only gave us an IC50 value of 0 0.06. So which means the combined two plants were actually much better. We also did an ABTS assay, again an antioxidant assay. We found similar results. Again, the hot and the cold extracts of the combined two plants 
were much more potent than the single herbs alone. And we also did an egg albumin assay, an anti-inflammatory assay, and we found some kind of moderate anti-inflammatory activity in the one-to-one -one ratios when compared to the positive control ibuprofen. So you can see actually that um, antioxidants play a major role in health, especially in cancers like, for example, lung cancers, breast cancers, or even prostate cancers, and also in cardiovascular diseases like hypertension, or even neurological diseases like Parkinson's disease. So therefore, I think these food supplements will help to protect the human body from oxidative stress arising from these diseases. And also it was actually an added benefit that this particular or these two food supplements showed some kind of anti-inflammatory activity and this can actually help in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example. So we suggest that we, um, these uh, food supplements can help in the elderly or even patients uh, who with certain diseases who cannot absorb much nutrients from their daily meals. So if I go on to the summary, so this uh, newly developed tea bag and the capsule uh, with a one-to-one -one ratio of the two plants showed very high antioxidant properties compared to the plants alone. So the combination was much better. And uh, so we think um, these two, um, the combinations actually showed good flavonoid and phenolic contents. And this may be a reason why we actually uh, found a good antioxidant activity in these two extracts. So obviously what we can say is that the combinatorial approach increases the synergistic effect of these plants. Even actually in um, the Sri Lankan traditional medicine, they actually encourage to have you know, many plants together. So I think uh, in conclusion, I could say that this development can be useful and it could be actually developed and uh, sold worldwide and bring revenue to our country. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Please stay with us for uh, Q&A session. Now the forum is open for Q&A session. Do you have any questions? Now, uh, now, now, I have one question, Angela. What is target group of this uh, food supplement? Is it a special group you are targeting a special group or special team? For example, the, the people who need nutrition or people who need uh, uh, additional health care or the sportsmen or whatever. Uh, are you targeting any target group? Yes, so uh, yes, I think this production is mostly good for the elderly and also probably patients maybe like you know just um, you know um, who have got cancer maybe or maybe some like cardiovascular diseases. So I think um, it would be actually helpful because it has very good antioxidant activity. So anybody could actually rather than having uh, normal black tea, we could suggest that they can have uh, this particular tea. Um, for their morning uh, as their morning breakfast tea. So maybe um, I would not particularly say like a target group, but maybe elderly or people who have various illnesses, it would be much uh, effective on them. Thank you, Dr. Angela. We'll move into the next person. Thank you.
most land mass of the flyway. So it is the terminus of many migratory species that flies along the Central Asian flyway. And it is also uh, the Central Asian flyway remains the world's least studied bird migratory flyway. Therefore, the information on its migration routes uh, of the species that takes this flyway remains largely lacking. More importantly, the Central Asian flyway encompasses a series of potential ecological barriers. The most formidable of it is the Himalayan mountain range. So that spans right across the entire breadth of Caps wintering range, which is the Indian subcontinent. So this is a 2000 kilometers long barrier and is as wide as 200 to 400 kilometers. The average elevation goes up to 6,000 meters above sea level and the highest peaks reach even higher than 8,000 meters. So you can understand Himalayas forms a massive and a globally unique barrier to avian migration. So let me explain what my research is about. So we are based in MANA, which is a migratory entrance point to Sri Lanka. So from MANA, we are aiming to understand the poorly known migration routes of several selected water bird species that takes our flyway. So we do this through long distance migration tracking using GPS GSM technology. And starting from 2020 up to date, we have tagged about 11 water bird species from MANA. So you can hear some of the example so for the tagged birds within our program. So the subject for today's talk is this important species, the brown-headed gull. The brown-headed gulls, uh, during the winter, they pass the non-breeding season along the coastline of the Indian subcontinent, including Sri Lanka, and they breed here in the high plateaus of South Central Asia. So this is a species that is likely to encounter the Himalayas during their annual migration. So we were aiming to understand the northward uh, the migration routes of the brown-headed gulls. For that, we captured two brown-headed gulls uh, from Mana, Sri Lanka. They are, uh, from their, from their non-breeding ground or the wintering ground. Uh, in 2021, we caught our first bird, uh, which we named Himakumari. It is an adult brown-headed, brown-headed gull. And our second bird we captured in 2020, which was an sub-adult, which we later on named Sherpa Tensi. So as soon as the birds were captured, we measured them, weighed, and marked them using metal bands and leg flags so you can see uh, how we like flag them. And finally, we deploy a satellite transmitter uh, on the birds as uh, in an external attachment method that goes as a backpack and they were immediately released. So we have uh, programmed the trackers to collect the GPS locations every one to two hours, depending on the battery conditions. So the positioning accuracy, this has a very good accuracy up to five meters. So for this purpose, for this paper, we have considered the northward migration uh, period only. So that uh, spans from, that starts from the, uh, their departure from their non-breeding ground in MANA until they arrive at their breeding grounds in the Tibetan plateau. So let me take you to the results section. So the map here summarizes uh, the northward migration of our tag cars. Uh, so they departed MANA. From MANA, they uh, traveled up to the high altitude lakes of the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, Himakumari, our first bird, traveled to Lake Angsiko, and Sherpa Tensi, which was tagged in 2022, uh, arrived at the Lake Kerenko. So these two lakes are located 200 kilometers apart from each other. So showing you the two lakes and how the birds utilize uh, the two lakes uh, uh, being uh, after being arrived at the uh, at the at those lakes uh, during the uh, the summer and they breed there during the uh, boreal summer so coming back to uh, explain the northward migration road the birds departed mana uh, between 25th april and 14th may and arrived at their breeding ground between uh, 5th and 20th may so accordingly their northward migration lasted for seven and a half days and during which they covered a distance of 3,200 kilometers approximately. And the birds, when they fly, they do not fly directly from Mana to Tibet. 
but they stopped over in the Ganges River. The two birds stopped over at two areas of the Ganges River. Our first bird, Himakumar, uh, stopped over uh, close to Varanasi of Uttar Pradesh, whereas uh, uh, Shepatan Singh uh, uh, stopped over in Patna, Bihar. Taking you to the uh, more details regarding the, the distances and temporal aspects of this northward migration, let me tell you about the migration speed. The gulls uh, had an overall migration speed uh, on average uh, 450 kilometers per day. So this includes uh, the stopover duration as well. Uh, when the travel speed, when the tra uh, travel days, only the travel days were considered, the, we could find that the, the speed even go, go as fast as 1,200 kilometers per day. Uh, and the gulls had an uh, instantaneous average, uh, instantaneous flight speed of 24 kilometers per hour. Interestingly, and this is about their Himalayan crossing. So both the birds cross the high peaks of Himalayas from Nepal. The maximum elevation they reach during this Himalayan crossing goes up to 18,900 feet above sea level. So the corresponding flying altitude above ground is about 890 meters. And now the surface elevation is already 4,800 meters above sea level. So explaining the, the two crossings separately, our first bird, Himakumari, uh, crossed the Himalayas uh, over the peak of Panbari Himal. The exact crossing altitude is uh, 18,000 feet, and it flew between the peaks of Manaslu and Nemjun. Nemjun, uh, the Manaslu is the world's eighth highest mountain peak. And moving to the, the uh, crossing of crossing by Sherpa Tensi, it flew over the peak of Chooyu, the crossing altitude is even higher now, 19,500 feet above sea level. So it flew right just 20 kilometers west to Mount Everest, which is the world's highest mountain peak. So we actually named the birds Sherpa Tensi, honoring the, the great Sherpa Tensi Noge who conquered this tallest peak for the first time in history. Okay. Uh, so, before the advent of satellite telemetry, as I mentioned in the very beginning of my presentation, we did not have concrete proof for the birds uh, that, reach, that, that they are capable of reaching such extreme altitudes of Himalayas. Even with the technology, uh, up to date, we have tracked only a handful of species to cross over the Himalayas. So, in depicting here in the slide, uh, I show you three species, the bar-headed goose, the demosile crane, and the steppe eagle. So all these three species have been found across over the Mount Everest, flying between 7,000 to 8,000 meters above sea level. So I want you to have a look at the body size and the weight of these birds. They weigh between two to four kilograms. So they are fairly big birds. So the, the, the species list who can cross over the Himalayas is really short. So from our study, we were able to add a new species to this list. So uh, this is the first evidence of brown-headed gull encountering this uh, kind of extreme altitudes during migration. And the interesting thing is uh, it weighs just a little less than 400 grams. So this is roughly about one fourth the weight of the uh, aforementioned species. So brown headed gull is likely to be the lightest gull species to cross over the Himalayas and also the lightest bird species that have been tracked so far uh, to cross over the Himalayas. So we will need further investigation to understand how this species is capable of overcoming such challenging uh, environments. and. Finally, in conclusion, our study provided the very first insights uh, to the northward the migration routes and stopover sites of these less known species within our flyway. And in future, uh, additional information on the southward migration route and also uh, by including a larger sample size, we would be able to provide greater insights into the uh, less known migratory strategy strategies of these species within the poorly studied Central Asian flyway.
So these are the key references that I use for this work. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our collaborative partners, our technical partner, the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, and our local funding partner, the Palmyra House Private Limited, and of course, the Department of Wildlife Conservation, the Ministry of Defense, and Sri Lanka Navy for their clearance and assistance throughout the study. Thank you. And I'm open for the questions. Yes, the forum is open for questions, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's a very interesting topic, actually. Uh, and also, it's a very new topic to me. So I just was curious to know that uh, how, the, how the birds can actually find the route to go to the breeding ground. Do you have an idea about that? Uh, actually, uh, the scientists have uh, come up with many uh, answers for that. So what I can say is they use uh, all these cues collectively. So. Uh, one thing is that uh, that the birds can sense the Earth's magnetism. So using that uh, cues, the birds might find their way. That is one answer. And they can also use this, uh, the solar constellation systems, the position of the moon, sun, and the stars. So they use that as well. And some birds are known to uh, that they can remember the landmarks. So they use that as well. And also this, the migratory direction and then the, the distance that they should fly. These are all coded within their genes. So it's like a pre-program. And uh, I, uh, so the correct answer should be they must be using a collection of all these cues. Okay, thank you. And also you said that you, you are uh, installing some kind of a GPS tracking uh, instrument onto the bird now. So how long the battery is going to last? Actually the, the trackers that we use uh, works of uh, uh, between three to five years. So these are solar power trackers. So a well uh, performing tracker would even uh, last up to five years. But you know that sometimes we uh, encounter technical failures and there are instances that uh, the, the, the trackers failed after a few months. But we have uh, so far, I told you that we are tracking the birds from 2020. 2020. Uh, so uh, the, the longest uh, performed tracker that we have at the moment is two years old. Okay, thank you. Then according to your presentation, then you said this is the smallest bird you identified in that crossing the particular area. Then uh, what is the and then uh, when compared with the other species, then what are the an possible anatomical or physiological changes uh, with this bird? Actually, uh, so we, we would need further investigation uh, to uh, uh, to study that further. So a lot of studies have been conducted with the bar-headed goose. They have unique uh, cardiorespiratory system and uh, they, you know that when they uh, reach that high altitudes, the air becomes thin, then the partial oxygen pressure drops and the birds should be physiologically adapted to extract the oxygen efficiency from this uh, oxygen deficient environment. What type of adaptations are you expecting? Uh, normally uh, that their lungs, hearts, and especially the mitochondria uh, would be uh, specialized uh, to uh, uh, facilitate the efficient, efficient extraction of oxygen uh, out of this uh, environment. So we, we, we need uh, for the investigation to study that in further. That is about the bar-headed bar goose, and which is the largest species, as I mentioned. Uh, but we have to go. We have, I think this opened up a new uh, arena for uh, uh, these kind of uh, uh, studies in the future. Yes. Yeah. I can answer on behalf of that. Uh, I'm part of the study. <laughs> uh, they have uh, the, the bird uh, respiratory system has this uh, continuous airflow system uh -huh. where blood flows, uh, air flows through the, uh, uh, not through the lung as it is. It has a, a eight chamber system where continuously uh, air flows through so, so the ventilation of the blood is about twice the higher rate than a, than a mammal. So that's one and all birds have that facility, but uh, in the low oxygen pressure, uh, studies have shown that in bar-headed goose, for example, the mitochondria has actually moved within the cell uh, towards the end of the, uh, to, by, to, the uh, to the cell membrane. Yeah. So, so that way they increase the oxygen uh, capturing uh, within the cell as well. So they have this because it's an anorexic condition in a really higher level, even trees won't grow in that uh, oxygen pressure. 
So, so they extract that and then the myoglobin levels are very high. Uh, it's like the entire body is like liver if you eat, a, eat, a, eat a, this sort of a bird. So the myoglobin levels are higher, the, even mitochondria has moved to the edge of the cell and then the, the, the capacity of the ventilation system, uh, the air to blood uh, transfer of oxygen is higher. So that's some of them. Uh, for the smaller birds, uh, nobody knows actually. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Now, this bird is good for tracking because we know that they are coming as a flock. Now, there are a large number of birds in a flock. How do you select this one is good for tracking because they might have some physical or physiological uh, barriers. So, how you are going to select the best, best uh, one? Normally, when we are capturing the birds, uh, we we just don't uh, capture the bird uh, the right away, the, the one that we need to tag, but we will uh, capture a sample. And from that, we would select the, the we would measure the weight and the body con condition health. So, and we also measure the, the fat content within their body. So, uh, based on all these things, then we select the best bird. Uh, most of the time, the heaviest bird, healthiest bird, and they must be ready to depart uh, the, the wintering ground. So most of the time that we do tagging just before their northward departure. So using that their plumage, uh, plumage begins to change just before the northward departure. So we can, we can uh, from that, we can guess that this bird is ready to depart. So it will have the, the breeding plumage, partial breeding plumage, and have very good fat content in the body and are uh, usually heavy. Uh, in compared to the other birds. So that is the way. In general, are they living alone? Uh, no, they live in flocks. So they are, they are highly gregarious birds. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah, do you have a question? Yes. Yes, yes. Sampa, do they maintain their flight altitude uh, at this 8,000 uh, meters all the way? They maintain, uh, we, we, have, we can get the flight altitude from the, from the track. So the, from the tracker, we can actually do the elevation from the sea level as well as the elevation from the ground level. So we know the altitude, so they maintain, but uh, then they're just in the higher peaks, they fly closer to the ground. And they also stop. They stop, they rest, and they fly. Uh, but uh, what we notice in the trans Himalayan crossing, uh, they don't stop at higher latitude. So altitude, they stop at the foothill, spend about uh, half a day, or in one case, a few days. And then uh, they fly at night, uh, the entire stretch uh, of slots yeah, uh, in one. By the morning, they were in the I think that is also one way of reducing uh, the physiological stress. Yes. Because they are like a marathon runner, mm -hmm. they just use all the all the all the energy, and that is where the critical importance of the uh, migratory stop goes. It's coming to play. We know that even in Colombo, some of the other during migration, birds come and they just drop. Mm -hmm. They don't die. They are so exhausted. Mm -hmm. so, like a marathon runner after the race, they basically use all their best you know, so they don't have any energy left. So they need to eat a specific food resource mm. and they depend on that resource and they utilize everything they have and go there and then spend few days, replenish and continue. So these birds through probably thousands of years might know where the next food depot is. So one uh, key idea of this project is to identify these critical stopover sites. Uh, anyway. Okay, thank you. Next presentation, uh, evaluation of effect of bacteria consortia on growth and yield of selected rice, rice varieties under greenhouse condition uh, by HMASP Jaisingh, DMJB Senanayak and uh, SG Kienage will be presented by HMASP Jaising. It's over to you.
Right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Aruna Jaisingha from Faculty of Agriculture, University of Rune. Do you know why scientists are tackled on growth promoting bacteria? Are they really beneficial? And can we replace inorganic fertilizer by growth promoting bacteria? So in advance of my presentation, you will understand the realistic situation of growth promoting bacteria. Here on words, I will use the abbreviation for plant growth promoting bacteria as PGPB. Actually, PB, PGPB is enhancing plant growth we are different mechanisms like provision of plant growth hormones as well as biological nitrogen fixation, phosphorus solubilization, and protect plants from different pathologic pathogens. We are different mechanisms like antagonistic effects. And also, they improve plant growth yield as well as the quality of the crops. Background for the, my research was rice cultivation is a major livelihood of people in Kamburubitiya mother area, and they mostly rely on inorganic fertilizer. Because inorganic fertilizer provide essential plant nutrients of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. New improved rice varieties are heavily responsive for inorganic fertilizer. Meanwhile, they are minimally performed under low soil fertility conditions. However, overuse of inorganic fertilizer is a huge burden to Sri Lankan economy, human health, as well as on the environment. Therefore, identification of an alternative and eco-friendly fertility improvement method is required for a sustainable rice production in Sri Lanka. Use of plant growth promoting bacteria might be a best solution for overcome these problems. Objective of the research was to determine the effect of selected bacterial consortia on performance of popular improved rice varieties of Cambrupetia under greenhouse condition. Under the methodology, selected plant materials were eight plant growth promoting bacterial consortia known as C1 to C8 and one bacterial isolate which has already identified as well performed under different conditions as well as for different rice varieties with inorganic fertilizer according to the deep, uh, recommendation of agriculture department. And selected new improved rice varieties were BG366 and BG3792. It was all together 22 treatments, treatment combinations, including the negative control. Research location was Faculty of Agriculture, University of Pruna during the Mahasis in 2021, 2022 under greenhouse condition. Two weeks old seedlings were transplanted in pots following complete randomized design with fire applicates. Bacterial treatments were applied as foley applications at two weeks after transplant. Measurements were test to flowering, plant height at flowering, number of grains per panicle, and number of effective tillers at harvest. NO and mean separation were done via SPSS 25 version. These are the results of BG366 variety. Effect of PGPB consortia on height at flowering for BG366. Here you can see that the highest plant height at flowering was recorded from consortium 3 and consortium 5, which is not significantly different from the plant height of inorganic fertilizer treatment. However, plant height at flowering of a negative control is significantly lower in contrast to consortium three and consortium five. In this photograph, you can clearly see that the plant height of consortium three is significantly higher in contrast to the plant height of 
consortium six and negative control. This is the variation of grains per panicle of variety BG366, where the highest number of grains per panicle has recorded from consortium one and uh, bacterial isolate B1, which are not significantly different from the treatment of inorganic fertilizer. However, those are significantly higher in contrast to the grains per panicle values of negative control. Via these photographs, you can clearly identify the situation. The lowest number of grains per panicle has recorded from the negative control. In contrast to that, inorganic fertilizer treatment has comparatively higher number of grains per panicle, but there's no significant difference in between uh, inorganic fertilizer treatment with consortium one and, one and bacterial isolate B1. Here onwards, the results of BG379 to variety. Effect of PGPB consortia on dust flowering of the variety, where the highest dust flowering has recorded from the inorganic fertilizer treatment. And the lowest value was from consortium three. You can see the plant of consortium three has already flowered, while the rest of the plants of treat other treatments are not flowered. This is the variation of height at flowering of treatments. We are the highest plant height at flowering was recorded from the inorganic fertilizer treatment and lowest from the bacterial isolate B1. This graph shows the variation of grains per panicle where the highest number of grains per panicle has recorded from the consortium two and consortium five, which are not significantly different from the inorganic fertilizer treatment, but significantly higher in contrast to the negative control. So you can uh, understand the situation. The lowest number of grains per panicle has recorded from the negative control and uh, uh, compare, compared to that highest uh, Inorganic fertilizer treatment has higher number of grains per panicle and the highest values from consortium five. This is the effect of plant growth promoting consortia on number of effective tillers at harvest. The highest number of effective tillers has recorded from consortium six, seven and bacterial isolate B1, which are significantly higher in contrast to inorganic fertilizer. This is a discussion. Plenty of research has conducted worldwide related to this area and using different different uh, price varieties. Accordingly, the significant effect of inoculated bacterial consortia on improvement of growth and yield of selected rice varieties might be due to complex interaction effects of bacteria with host rice plants. If I conclude my findings, both varieties are significantly affected by bacterial consortia on plant height at flowering and grains per panicle, while BG366 for days to flowering and BG379 to for effective tillers at harvest under greenhouse condition. And consortia three and five has positive effects on both varieties and neither consortium without significant effect on any variety tested. And above results indicate the need of a field trial, as well as further evaluations on plant growth and yield under field conditions with more varieties and different locations would be necessary. These are my references. And my acknowledgement to the academic and non-academic staff of Faculty of Agriculture, University of Pune, and to the organizing committee of IRC 2022 KDU. And thank you for your great collaboration. Thank you for your presentation. Now it's open for discussion. Yeah, they have a astrobacter.
acinetobacter bacillus and uh, even rhizobium also sets of yes. bacteria okay so yeah. th then uh, so, so after you apply in the bacteria so you apply only one time no parallel to uh, inorganic fertilizer treatment because uh, department of agriculture recommend strict application of uh, inorganic fertilizer so in parallel to that uh, bacterial is, uh, application also also done so then like after you apply in the bacteria how do you confirm that the, the the thing actually the the growth promotion actually coming from the same bacteria because there are some other bacteria can be grown no so can you please repeat once again yeah i'm asking that uh, once you apply the the bacterial culture or whatever the, the bacteria into yeah. the plant so how do you confirm that the growth promotion actually coming from that bacteria because there yeah. are some other bacteria can be grown no exactly there are uh, endophytic uh, bacteria uh, inside the plants and uh, to confirm that i done the reisolation process and identify the the, uh, the spread or applied bacteria so are they inside the plants after after two two um, two months of application means uh, just before the flowering okay thank you okay yeah, uh, how could you make sure that whatever the bacteria you adding will not have any adverse or negative effects for the environment because uh, adding bacteria and make high concentration of bacteria might cause negative impact for the environment actually sir these all these bacteria so isolated from the soil so they are um, actu actually exist in the soil so uh, adding in high concentration might not be a uh, harmful to the uh, environment so uh, because most of them are live as endophytes even as endophytes within the uh, most of the rice uh, in naturally also now uh, you said uh, now a lot of field trials is suggested yes exactly as an intrusion then now how are we going to do it uh, actually sir uh, this with the big aim of introduction to even for the farmers mm -hmm. uh, before going to such level we have to do more trials uh, repeated trials with uh, different locations uh, this is as a initial trial at, as a pot experiment mm -hmm. so we have to do the same experiment even even in different location of mm -hmm. uh, the country as well as different uh, fields in different locations mm -hmm. and uh, the problem is uh, actually sometimes this you are right uh, this uh, species might be uh, variety species sometimes uh, if the bacteria uh, perform well for a particular variety and uh, will not perform under another variety so we have to uh, do that for uh, ex uh, at least for the major highly popular varieties within the country after that we can go for a uh commercialization or what kind of other kind of uh, activity okay any questions yes. so my question is related to what uh, the chairperson asked uh, yeah. so why you want to emphasize the greenhouse condition here in your title so if you are like what is the purpose of greenhouse in this the, now you're trying to do it in different locations so i'm just ask curious about your title yeah uh, means as an initial trial it was done under greenhouse condition because under the greenhouse uh, we are maintaining the optimum conditions that uh, plants and cell as the bacteria can grow but uh, for in in further trials we have to go for field trials also as that's, initial trial it is that's, uh, yeah, that's my concern trial. because now if you do it in actual paddy fields yeah it's, exactly it's, different the uh, situation uh, that might be useful no? in the natural environment so as initially we have to find out what are the uh, bacteria which perform well at the initial level and then we can go for a uh, field trial okay right. thank you very much for thank your presentation you. now the next presentation the title uh, aspartic proteases inhibitory activity of uh, pleurotus ostreatus black oyster growing in sri lanka Authors A. L. T. Ampe Mohanty, S. Rajapaksha, T. S. Suresh, K. D. K. P. Kumari uh, will be presented by A. L. T. Ampe Mohanty. Over to you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I am AALT Amte Mohanty, student of Faculty of Graduate Studies, General Sir John Katalawala Defence University. So today I am going to uh, present my research study titled as Aspartic Protease Inhibitory Activity of Pleuritus Ostriatus Growing in Sri Lanka. So this is the outline of my research and under all these subtopics, I'm about to uh, expose my research findings. First of all, I need you to have a background idea, uh, background idea about this research. So what are proteases? Proteases are enzymes which have the ability to catalyze the proteolysis process. It's a biological process. It means breaking down the polypeptide chains into simple amino acids. There are few types of proteases. Commonly, this uh, division is basically uh, depending on the amino acid residue which is present in the active site of enzymes like aspartic, glutamic, medulloproteases, cysteine, serine, threonine, likewise. So, almost all these proteases are playing a, a diverse physiological uh, functions in all living organisms, including plants, animals, and also microorganisms. Uh, among all these proteases, my major focus is on aspartic proteases. So there are a few types of uh, aspartic proteases, pepsin, catepsin, D, E, and renin likewise. So all these aspartic proteases are also contributing for numerous biological functions like digestion, uh, blood pressure regulations, hormone production and release likewise. The thing is, uh, these aspartic proteases are contained in pathogens as well. So uh, those uh, aspartic proteases are playing a critical role in their replication process. Therefore, such proteases are considered as a virulence factor of infectious diseases. Other than that, irregular secretions uh, of irregular secretions of uh, these aspartic proteases are uh, leading to uh, different pathological conditions like uh, neurogenerative diseases and also arthritis, uh, cardiovascular diseases, cancer likewise. So we are in need to find out a tangible solution for uh, that problem to mitigate or to eliminate such uh, negative drawbacks. So in here, my major focus is uh, on natural protease inhibitors because they are having uh, a great potential to prevent tumor progression, metastasis of breast cancers, uh, regulating blood pressure, other than that, they are having numerous biotechnological potentials like anti-tumor, anti-insecticidal, antimicrobial, likewise. Uh, there were different research and preliminary studies. They have revealed that uh, most of uh, natural products are containing considerable amount of uh, protease inhibitors. But unfortunately, there weren't any extensive or detailed study about uh, protease inhibitors, especially aspartic protease inhibitors. Therefore, in this study, my ma major aim was to screen and characterize aspartic protease inhibitory activity of Pleuritus ostriatus growing in Sri Lanka. Common name is black oyster. And in the meantime, I wanted to find out uh, optimum mushroom extracts concentration to obtain maximum amount of aspartic protease inhibitors, named as APIS. And in the characterization part, I wanted to assess the effect of uh, several physical and chemical parameters uh, and how they are affecting uh, to the activity and stability of APIS. And let's move on to the methodology part. So the whole methodology I have divided into two major groups, screening and the characterization. So in the screening part, as you can see in this slide, I have divided the whole screening part into uh, three subgroups. Uh, let's see uh, they in detail. 
So in the sample preparation, mushrooms were cleaned, washed and powdered well in order to prepare a 20% uh, extract and used it as natural aspartic protease inhibitor. And the main thing is in the objective also, I mentioned it, I wanted to find out what is the optimum concentration. Therefore, in uh, here, I uh, prepared a concentration series uh, from uh, 20% to 0.65 and uh, determination of the inhibitory activity, I used pepsin as my aspartic protease enzyme rather than other enzymes because uh, in previous research and study, they used uh, this pepsin enzyme as a standard and uh, due to its availability, I uh, thought it would be more beneficial to go for the pepsin enzyme and uh, used egg white as my substrate and incubated all those three uh, for 60 minutes and uh, at uh, 37 Celsius. And all the reactions were arrested by adding TCA, trichloroacetic acid. And uh, after the centrifugation uh, stage, the absorbances of clear supernatants were measured at uh, 280 nanometer in a UV visible spectrophotometer. So the calculations were done uh, by using this mentioned equation. So in the characterization part, as I mentioned you earlier, there were, there were several uh, physical and chemical parameters. So each parameter has separated different conditions as you can see clearly in this slide. So in the temperature study, I changed the temperature, uh, incubating temperature. And also uh, in the pH study, I used uh, uh, buffers with, which ha had uh, different pH conditions. So in the metal line uh, and detergent reducing and oxidizing agent, uh, all these three parameters, I did the pre-incubate stage uh, with the plant extract and that uh, re uh, respective uh, agent. And then the same procedure was followed in order to implement the uh, normal acid. So let's move on to the results and discussion. So this is the uh, graph which I got from the screening results. So as you can see here, surprisingly, I got the highest amount of uh, aspartic protease inhibitors at the concentration of 1.25. The value is 69.12. Uh, the highest concentration and the lowest concentration didn't get, didn't give any positive results. So in the characterization part, the first parameter I checked was uh, temperature. So uh, amazingly, I got highest amount of uh, uh, aspartic protease inhibitors under the uh, 60 Celsius and uh, it was a significant uh, amount and but it was drastically reduced up to 0 0.81 at uh, 80 celsius so in the ph study i used different uh, ph conditions but posit uh, the positive uh, only i get the positive results under two ph conditions this is the uh, graph which I uh, got for the metal ion study, the effect of metal ions on the activity of APIS. So these are the metal ions I used to uh, did that uh, study. And for better clarification and uh, for better comparison, I entered a control bar as well. So uh, the, in the presence of uh, these metal ions, the uh, aspartic protease inhibitory activity got reduced up to certain level. So this is the graph uh, which is illustrating the results of detergent reducing agents and oxidizing agents, how they are affecting to the activity of aspartic protease inhibitors. So the green color bars are representing the control results and uh, whereas the blue color bars are uh, representing the test results. So in the presence of these 
three agents, the inhibitory activity was uh, reduced uh, to a certain extent. And in the conclusion, it is possible to uh, say that the black oyster mushroom is a great source of natural aspartic protease inhibitor and also highest uh, aspartic protease uh, inhibitor per percentage can be obtained at 60 Celsius, implying its thermostability. Uh, and we are intending to do more uh, purification process and uh, hope to introduce, uh, hope to develop a drug or potential therapeutic agent for potential diseases. So I think it's a good feature, beneficial feature in order to uh, face for different uh, industrial manipulations. So uh, in the pH study, the maximum and optimum uh, uh, results were get from uh, pH 2 since aspartic proteases requires more acidic pH to be proteolytically activated and in the presence of different metal ions and detergent oxidizing reducing agent the uh, inhibitory percentage was reduced and these are the references uh, I got my information and I would like to convey my gratitude to the KDU grant for the financial assistance. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Now the open for QA session. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, I have just one question about your temperature studies. So in your temperature studies, you have uh, studied like 40 degrees Celsius and then 60 and then 80. And you got the highest results at uh, 60 degrees Celsius, no? Have you checked the, uh, the activity in between 40 and 60 and 60 and 80? 40 and 60, I uh, checked the inhibitory activity at uh, 37 Celsius. But no, 40 and 60. 40 and 60, uh, no. It's better to check because it's yeah. a huge variation within yeah. like 20 degrees Celsius. So you maybe have like a higher activity than that, maybe at like 50 degrees Celsius. We don't know. It's better to check. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. Now, this is a general question. Now, what is your ultimate goal? Ultimate goal is uh, to uh, develop a potential therapeutic agent or drug mm -hmm. by using natural aspartic protease inhibitors because these days people are using synthetic protease inhibitors mm -hmm. for uh, different diseases like AIDS likewise. So uh, my intention was to uh, do some preliminary study to find out what are the natural products that we can get uh, natural protease inhibitors in a considerable level. And uh, then after a purification stage and uh, do some uh, studies and then the ultimate goal is to find. But in general, uh, some mushrooms, some species are highly toxic. Sometimes yes, that type of uh, contaminants may be there in this type of mushroom source. Yes, Therefore, sir. you have to do the proper toxicological yeah. study before implement that yeah. into that. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> I have. Sir. Yeah. Can we go back to the slide where you measured your enzyme activity? I mean, the, how, how, how you prepared your samples for enzyme activity measurements? The methodology. Mushrooms are clean, washed, and powdered. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, uh, you have done it well, but uh, I have some comments on that. You prepared a 20% solution of the mushroom okay. powder, whatever. Right? Yeah. Uh, how many samples you prepared it 
it in this way? Uh, actually, sir, I uh, did the same procedure for six time and uh, got the average. And uh, uh, I, uh, you mean uh, about the sample? Yeah, yeah, you prepared many samples. Yeah. Okay. The point here is uh, when you do math, your experimentation work or sample preparation, enzyme activity measurements at the lab manually. Uh, you do lots of manual practice. The manual practice can't be the same from one, uh, one occasion to another, even within the same individual. So therefore, there is a variation which we normally call experimental variation. Uh, we, what we do is we usually normalize our values at the end of the assay. Uh, to reduce to reduce and even eliminate experimental variation. In this case, you could have easily measured total protein content in your 20% solution preparation and uh, divide your readings by that. So that is something necessary. If you do that, you would probably see different trends in results. So please try to do it next time around. That is very important if you plan to uh, get this published as well. Okay, thank you very much. The next presentation, the title, Insecticide Susceptibility of uh, EDC GPT in CMC Area for Commonly Used IRS Agents, Lambda Cyhalo 3. Uh, MMASP Marasinghe, ASP Pereira, sorry, ASAPS Pereira, GATA Rajatilaka, P. Madhushan, I. Veera Singha, S. Samaravira, and DSAF uh, Deera Singha will be presented by MMASP Marasan. It's over to you. Good evening to you all. I'm uh, Satira Marasinghe from uh, Entomologist, Ministry of Health, uh, representing National Dengue Control Unit of Sri Lanka. Here to present the, uh, our paper, Insecticide Susceptibility of EDCG Tie in CMC, Kalam Municipal Council area, for a commonly used IRS agent, Lamba Silohetri. So as you all know, Dengue is a major vector-borne disease in Sri Lanka, being endemic within the country since mid-1960s. Uh, in Sri Lanka, Aedes aegypti is considered as the primary vector and Aedes albopictus as the secondary vector, which could transmit all four serotypes in the dengue virus. From an uh, annual suspected caseload of uh, 35,000 to 50,000, 35 to 40 percent dengue cases have been reported from the Western province and observed to be more contagious in Colombo Municipal Council area. So CMC area has often exposed to chemical interventions or control strategies in successive period uh, of outbreaks to control EDC chip density with space spray as well as uh, indoor residual spray that means IRS uh, using the lambda silohetrine as the IRS agent. Uh, in recommending chemical vector control strategies, it is known a uh, fact uh, imposed by World Health Organization to monitor the resistance development of the local mosquito population to adjust the intervention accordingly. So here we have assessed the susceptibility of ADC type in CMC area uh, towards lambda silohetrine as an aspect of this resistant monitoring. So colony rearing and management is the first important aspect of this process. So while the ADC Egypti mosquito eggs were collected through Ovicrap surveillances, uh, then the rare in the standard laboratory conditions at National Dengue Control Unit uh, up to F1 adult stage. So total of 110 mosquitoes were used to test on the discriminative dosage for both years and another 100 to assess the susceptibility on the higher dosage. So WHO standard diagnostic kits to test the susceptibility of mosquitoes were used along with the WHO guidelines on needed susceptibility testing uh, released on 2016. And here you can see the uh, summary of our concentrations. So in summary, uh, there are five test tubes and two control tubes, which are made out of hard polyethylene 
and marked with red dots and yellow dots, respectively. Both ends are made out of with screw caps. And there are also seven holding tubes, which are marked with green dots, where the mosquitoes are contained for one hour before transferring into the test tubes and control tubes. So inner surfaces of holding tubes were lined up with pre-prepared clean white papers hold into place with two steel uh, spring wire clips and the prepared holding tubes were fit to the side of a sliding unit marked with green stripes through which 20 mosquitoes into each tube were transferred to be kept for an hour in an upright position. So, sorry. Uh, meantime, the test tubes were lined similarly with WHO standard lambda xylohetrid insecticide impregnant papers and hauled into place with copper spring wire slips to avoid any reaction with the insecticide. The test tubes and the control tubes were connected to holding tubes using the sliding unit while matching the red dot of the test tube with the red uh, stripe of the sliding unit and the yellow dot to the control tube with the yellow stripe. Through the shifting of sliding unit, all the mosquitoes were transferred into test and control tubes by blowing gently and kept upright for another one hour, allowing the mosquitoes to be acclimatized. After one hour, all the mosquitoes were transferred into holding tubes and kept upright with the mesh cap up on top. Cotton pads soaked with 10% sugar solution were kept on the mesh for feeding requirements. All the holding tubes were kept for 24 hours to assess the mortality. So observed mortality was calculated using the shown formula. And if mortality exceeded 10% in the control tubes, the Abbott formula was used to correct the mortality of all the expected groups, exposed groups. According to WHO interpretations, if the mortality is between 90 to 100%, it was considered as in, uh, indicated susceptibility. Mortality less than 98% is considered as suggested resistance and the suspected presence of resistant genes in the vector population was indicated by mortalities between 90 to 97%. So as you can see in 2020, test mortalities were five and 44%, which are extremely low. And in 2022, they were 12 and three, which are even more, even lower. Only when the higher dosages were exposed to the mosquitoes, the mortality increased up to 88% in 2022. As the control mortality is lower than 10%, as you can see, we were not used the Abbott formula to correct the mortalities. So ultimately, all the populations test came as resistant to lambda xylohetrine. So in 2020 June, uh, this is the same thing we, we have talked about. So the test procedures were conducted in strict laboratory conditions following the guidelines issued by WHO regarding insecticide susceptibility testing. The feed collection of EDC eggs and laboratory activities were conducted under the guidance and the coordination of National Link Control Unit, where these uh, test procedures were facilitated with optimal conditions. In all the instances, uh, susceptibility testing for EDC die in CNC area against lambda xylohetrine, none has exhibited uh, indicated uh, susceptibility with nearly enough mortality rates for any given concentration in the study. Uh, this indicates that the resistant population of it is Egypt type for lambda xylohetrine, which even can tolerate higher dosages, has almost established. We are using lambda xylohetrine to control EDC Egypt type in CMC area is no longer productive. This may have been resulted by frequent unmonitored application of IRS done in the area in a case by manner to control disease transmission. So irrational use of insecticide with no shifting between chemical classes has led to establishment of highly resistant mosquito population in CNC area. It is by evidence that has been identified execution of IRS is strictly related with the biomics of the particular vector, especially their resting habits and habitats. Hence IRS programs conducted without proper study of vector biomics in local context are not only increasing the activity of resistant populations, but also wasting valuable assets, which can be used efficiently in vector control programs in Sri Lanka. 
So my references, and I need to thank to my co-authors as well as the principal investigator, also Director National Link Control Unit. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Now it's open for question and answer. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. So I have two questions to ask. The first one is the difference between the times that you used in two different years. Yes. So what is that uh, difference? Yeah. One is November so, and the May. So what is that let difference? Me go back. So 2020, we had ordered only the discriminatory dosage of this uh, insecticide impregnated papers. And in 2022, we had uh, the papers. Uh, actually, in the 2021, we couldn't uh, get the papers because of the shutdown of the borders and everything. So the the uh, continuation we as we like we couldn't do that but we ultimately got that in 2022 then we got the, all the papers we need then we conducted so however uh, in 2020 and compared to 2022 the uh, indication of the uh, resistance can be seen uh, with the guidelines of the WHO okay then that's okay. just fine just one last question yeah. I'm asking because I'm curious about the you're looking at the depth of the mosquitoes. Yeah. So after you expose this uh, agent to your mosquitoes, yes. how was the depth? I mean, do they suddenly die or they die with time exposure? No, no. When we keep them for one hour, they, uh, they uh, just uh, go around that chamber for a few minutes. And then we actually monitor because of this is a permethrin, a pyroid grade class chemical. We monitor uh, around uh, five to 10 minutes. We each, for each five to 10 minutes, we monitor their habit and how they are reacting to the chemical. So at first, they can, there can be few mosquitoes uh, suddenly get killed and uh, drop down uh, quickly. But there can be some mosquitoes uh, hovering over there and there. But ultimately, if the, if the uh, insecticide is powerful enough, they should be knocked down by the end of the 24 hours mortality. But uh, it's not a sudden process, but gradually they have to be. Yes, but finally you said that is... Uh not effective. Yes. Right. Then what is good? So this is a pyrethroid, like one class, but there are so many other classes of insecticides. So we are recommending now because the CNC is now in, not in our jurisdiction. We are a national body. The CNC is a municipal council. So they are procuring their own uh, chemicals. So we are advising them now to go for another class, uh, alternatively do the uh, chemical intervention. So now, now they are accepting our uh, proposals. Find another chemical. Yes, definitely. There are chemicals, oh. but they have not used it, but now they are uh, accepting our advices. Yeah, thank you very much for your, thank you very much for your presentation. It's not uh, directly related what you present here today, yes. but uh, you present here the adult sites. No? What yes. about the larvae sites, uh, CMC or whatever the dengue control units? using any larvicides or larval control methods? Absolutely. National Dengue Control is, is actually uh, recommending and supporting to use larvicide rather than adult side because adult sites are more, uh, more keen to have the susceptibility, so the resistance. So the larvicide is not like that. They are they're acting in the water bodies and, uh, and they are uh, acting in that uh, container. So we are recommending the larvicides, but there are also tests for larvicide susceptibility also. But uh, the most uh, main issue here, because we need to have a quick uh, intervention to drop down the mosquito population as much as possible to reduce the transmission. So larvicide, we have around two to three weeks gap to control, but not the adult mosquito. Therefore, we need to check as well, soon as possible the adult uh, susceptibility, but we're also checking the uh, larvicide as, as well. And what about the uh, environmental uh cleaning and other things. Now, those things, whenever the dengue epidemics are there, uh, CMC and the dengue control unit using all the public media and try to enlighten the general population. Yeah. But yeah. after the epidemic gone, it is also the, these things are going down. Again, yeah. it will come back in the epidemic thing. So yeah. why don't I mean the dengue control, I mean, you, are, you are from the CMC, I think, not the dengue control unit, but uh, can't you, I mean, recommend it to continue this uh, social media, enlightened teaching and other things uh, 
to continue because otherwise yeah. only during that period they are doing that <laughs> again the mishap between the jurisdiction because uh, we can only make the policy and advise them because it is not within our uh, jurisdiction but we are now contacting them and uh, we are maintaining our uh, rapport with them and uh, i hopefully in the future we can achieve more actually thank you very much thank you now uh, today our final presentation uh, the title factors affecting the performance anxiety for under 19 male cricket players performance in kalambu district sri lanka uh, wscj virako and pp virako d uh, will be presented by wscj virako so much you Good evening, all of you. Uh, thank you for giving me this immense opportunity for, for from KDU. Uh, according to Judy Picard, he said that anxiety like a rocking chair. It's give you something to do, uh, but it doesn't get you very far. So I expect uh, to present the topic of. factors affecting the performance anxiety for under 19 male cricket players performance in kalambu district sri lanka under the paper id 609 i am chamdu virakon uh, department of sports science and management faculty of applied sciences sabaragam university of sri lanka let's move to the content uh those are the contents of my presentation uh, in here uh, under the literature review uh, it present theoretical empirical and methodological uh, uh, literature uh, respectively uh, uh, then move to uh, introduction uh, anxiety is emotional uh, characterized uh, by feelings of tension worried thoughts and uh, physical changes like increase in the blood pressure uh, all the human ha have some kind of anxiety level uh, because uh, uh, you can feel some uh, some situation uh, we have uh, uh, sweating in the palm uh some that that kind of physical changes uh, comes to the uh, an anxiety uh, fact uh an anxiety can be divided state anxiety and uh, threat anxiety furthermore uh low level anxiety moderate level anxiety and high level anxiety are three different level of anxiety uh categor categories in there uh, and also we we all know cricket is most of you one of the most popular sport in the world especially in sri lanka uh, all the part of sri lanka uh, mo most of school play, school play uh, cricket uh, uh uh in order to uh, this study uh, the study try to identify how to factors affect in the uh, performance anxiety for under 19 male cricket players in kalambu district in sri lanka uh, that is my problem statement uh, when it come to the uh, objective the major objective of the, uh, this study was to identify the factors affect in the performance performance anxiety for under 19 male cricket players 
performance in Kalambu district and his specific objective was to identify the performance anxiety for under 19 male cricket players in Kalambu district. Uh, under the theoretical literature, uh, the dimension of uh, the dimension have identified the uh, independent variable of anxiety and uh, different dependent variable of cricket player performance. Uh, so low level anxiety, moderate level anxiety, and high level anxiety are uh, dimension of uh, independent variable of anxiety and the dimension of uh, cricket player performance are batting average and bowling average. Uh, after the studying empirical and methodological uh, literature, uh, the study was found no fear academic uh, work investigate the relationship between anxiety and cricket players performance in Sri, Sri Lanka. Uh, that's why the, the topic is very important for the uh, sport factor in Sri Lanka. Uh, let's move to the methodology. Uh, uh, the, so all the data was collect, collecting by uh, questionnaire of uh, sport competition anxiety test. It is normally called SCAT. Uh, SCAT. Uh, it, is, uh, it is normally used for uh, getting anxiety level uh, and how to uh, find uh, someone who have uh, uh, level of uh, anxiety. Uh, so, uh, under the uh, deductive and quantitative research approach uh, were used in uh, this, uh, uh, this study uh, and sample frame was under 19 mm, cricket players in Colombo district. Uh, it is get from uh, single, single under 19 cricket tournament uh, uh, which, is, which is conducted by the school cricket association uh, and the sample size was uh, 47 male cricket players uh, in, in this tournament uh, uh, and all primary and secondary data were analyzed uh, by using Minitab 17 analytical software. Uh, uh, let's move to the result. Uh, the table one uh, is presented variance of bat batsman uh, batting performance uh, and in, in p-value uh, is uh, also uh, uh, less than significant level of 0, 0 0.05. Uh, therefore, it can be uh, uh, it can be rejected null hypothesis and uh, conclude some anxiety level have different mean uh, and uh, and the table two is uh, presented variance of bowlers bowling performance. Uh, it's also their fee value is uh, less than uh, significant uh, value of 0 0.05. Uh, therefore, uh, it's concluded some uh, anxiety level have difference. Uh, uh, let's move to the table tree. Uh, the table tree uh, presented the variance of uh, all rounders batting performance. In here, uh, uh, the p-value of uh, all-rounders batting performance means are significantly uh, higher than uh, 0 0.05. They are, uh, therefore, uh, uh, we cannot be rejected uh, null hypothesis 
in the uh, all rounders batting performance uh, let, let's move to the conclusion the moderate level anxiety uh, moderate level batsman batting average mean value is higher and always bowlers bowling average mean value is lower than high anxiety level and low anxiety level uh, and the moderate level of all rounders batting average mean value is higher and the bo bowling average mean value is lower than high and low level uh, anxiety but it is not significantly proved uh, moderate level anxiety are highly effective in players batting and bowling performance uh, uh, let's move to the recommendation players coaches and master in charge and parents should get the responsibility for maintain and keep players anxiety level in moderate level high and low anxiety level player uh, should do anxiety preventing activities for do moderate level and uh, repeating this study for other team also uh, these are the reference i use uh, in this presentation uh, thank you for all the uh, support giving me for this study thank you for your presentation now it's open for question and answer anova table can you go to the anova table please yeah yeah so so yeah this is better uh, so so your categorization is high low and moderate so it, so you had a so you how you quantify anxiety as a high and anxiety medium anxiety low anxiety like that or you had actual variable to measure that so there is a uh, test sport uh, competition and side test yeah they have uh, some uh, mark system yeah uh, they give questionnaire for the players and get the uh, so it's a scoring scoring yes, system yes, yes. so then if that is a scoring system you can't use anova so you then you have to use high, high square or some uh, non parametric test uh, i think you use uh, your anxiety data set cannot be analyzed using uh, anova the way it look at least percent that test based on the question here what is the scale like uh, i mean this is a common problem don't don't get too upset but uh, i think your analysis is wrong you can fix it it's uh, you can do this analysis using using i think high high square test would be a better better one right yeah yeah, yeah this is category so you can do a parametric test uh, for that right uh, there's a small twist if you are if you can measure anxiety say like a hormonal level or some other way then you can use this mm. uh, your data set is not continuous right and i have another small question then uh, how did you measure the performance performance basically trick, uh, ticket play performance uh, measuring batting and bowling average uh, how do you define the average now uh, you have in, criteria uh, in uh, uh, literature uh, mm -hmm. use they can get uh, about 30 is good average for the batsman and uh, runs, 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 runs. batting average mm -hmm. below 30 is uh, good good average for the bowlers bowling performance mm -hmm. Any questions? Right. Sorry. They are found to be there in high level and moderate anxiety groups. In my study, I found uh, nine players in uh, low level anxiety uh, and thirty four players in moderate anxiety level. And four players in high level and side. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, I have I have same uh, same problem because uh, the all rounders performers uh, fifteen. Uh, I have find the players, but uh, the all rounders uh, wicket taken is uh, only two players uh, in uh, get the wicket in this particular uh, tournament. Therefore. Uh, it can be significantly two in uh, all rounders performance. Okay, right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much for giving this immense opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all presenters uh, for sharing your research uh, finding with us. And now we move into the final section of the session, a summing up session. And I would like to congratulate all presenters uh, because you have presented uh, scientifically sound uh, evidence to prove your findings in different different ways for different different fields. In the first presenter, talk about the food supplements with uh, high nutritional content developed using medicinal plants in Sri Lanka as a tea bag and a capsule. And as you know, there are a lot of medicinal plants in Sri Lanka with that activity. I think you will be able to develop uh, that as a commercial product uh, in future that may be valuable for the institution as well as to the country. And the second presenter uh, was uh, com uh, completely on the different topic, right? She talked about the northward migration of uh, Sri Lanka wintering brown-headed gulls. The research identified the brown-headed gull is likely to be the lightest gull species to be recorded to cross the Himalaya. Uh, the weight of them about about 400 grams it is incredible and the third presentation was the evaluation of effect of bacterial consortia on uh, growth of feed of yeast and uh, selected rice varieties under greenhouse condition at present i think the title is very important now we are struggle in, in that area and uh, the present emphasized that the requirement of further field trials of uh, potential consortia to replace the inorganic fertilizer we hope we'll continue the studies uh, as soon as possible. In the next presentation, the Ampe Mahoti talk about the black oyster growing in Sri Lanka. They identified the black oyster growing in Sri Lanka is a potential source of uh, active aspartic protease inhibitor. I think use as a drug for uh, like uh, various diseases uh, like HIV. In some countries, they are using HIV, uh, the, this particular extract for HIV patients too, and. Uh, then the next study that conducted on insecticide, insecticide susceptibility of uh, DC gypti, gypti in uh, Colombo Medical Colombo uh, Municipal Council area for commonly used uh, indoor residual strain agent, uh, lambda cyhalothrin. However, the, finally, the investigators highlighted that the lambda cyhalothrin to control ADC gypti in CMC area is no longer uh, effective. Therefore, we have to think about uh, new chemicals too. The final presentation was uh, factors affecting the performance anxiety for 119 male cricket players performance in Colombo district, uh, Sri Lanka. The study concluded that the batting and bowling performances in a study population are significantly impacted by the moderate level of anxiety. And uh, okay, again, I would like to congratulate all of presenters again, and let me conclude the session. Thank you. That was truly an in interesting session. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. J. M. K. Bijasekara for the cooperation. And as well, I would like to thank uh, all the presenters for their efforts and uh, for such interesting topics discussed today in the fourth session. Now, I would like to uh, call upon Assistant Director of KDU Care to hand over the token of appreciation to the chair of the fourth session, Dr. J. M. K. B. Jayasekara.
Thank you, sir. And now I would like to take this opportunity to, uh, opportunity to thank uh, the eminent judges at the panel who uh, was contributing much from the first session, from the start of the first session. To award the token of appreciation to the judges, I would like to call upon coordinator of the session of the basic and applied sciences, uh, Dr. Sampad B. Alahakun. First of all, I would like to call upon Dr. Nandana Gunavikrama. Dr. Nalaka Sumanaratna. And Dr. Savidya Chayabhadana. Thank you, sir. 